Okay, good morning. So, uh, when we first got involved in RIS-5, about oh, 18 months ago, uh, my boss asked me to come figure out, first of all, it was the technology viable? We spent some time looking at it. Uh, after about six months or so, we said, yep, definitely makes sense. And he said, okay, great, figure out how to incorporate it into a kind of industrial design flow. In microcontroller, we put out about probably 20 chips a year. So how do you, uh, how can we use this technology to rapidly innovate and still maintain our process? Because that's important in an industrial setting. So he picked the software guy, he picked me to figure it out. And um, so I manage software and microcontroller. What I'm going to do is talk through what um, some of the lessons learned we uh, went through and experienced getting this technology integrated into our process. And, uh, and then share some other thoughts along the way. So uh, some of the key messages I want to I share with you, I think uh, one of the things we're, we're trying to do is have software drive hardware more. What that means is have software be able to drive more of the hardware requirements earlier on in the, um, in the life cycle. Uh, the, the current hardware software co-design phase theoretically allows for that, but practically doesn't happen a lot. And so we wanted to get more software involvement early on, driving very specific hardware requirements. So we looked at that, and we thought RISC-V was a technology that would allow us to do that. Secondly, because of the openness of the technology, we felt that there was some similar things we could apply from our, the software side of the world and open source communities and collaboration. Uh, we, we very aggressively participate and collaborate in upstream software that we develop. Uh, and we see pretty good leverage from the community when we do that, both in collaboration as far as reuse. So we felt there was an opportunity here as well. Like Chris has said earlier this morning, it's kind of the same, only different on some of these open communities, hardware versus software. So I'll talk a little bit about that because um, there are some differences there. And then. Again, we were trying to stress test this whole, this whole technology. Could we incorporate it into an industrial setting and actually put real product out the door? What do we learn along the way? What are the cycles of learning that we can improve on? And so these were kind of the three things we looked at, and those are the key things I'm going to try to hit on here. So you're all probably familiar with this, this traditional hardware software co-design. And you know, in Embedded, a lot of what we do in microcontrollers and in, in in our business is uh, embedded stuff. And so uh, we, we pretty much follow this model. Um, and we're organized somewhat along these same lines, hardware teams, software teams. Uh, now, eventually, you have to map this into an actual organizational process. Again, try, anytime you're trying to do new technology and in, in integration uh, from whatever you're trying to integrate into your, your company or corporation, there is a process to go through. One is we had to adhere to the current organizational development process. So, but we're, we're fundamentally aligned to this model. I'd say there's not quite the nice balance between hardware and software sometimes, but uh, roughly, if you squint a little bit, it pretty much makes sense. So we had to map that into uh, a process, and we do have a, a defined organizational process. So one of the first things we had to do is, with open technology of any sort, make sure that you can map that properly into a process. For example, an open source software you know, do you have to go through certain types of checks and scans with software coming in the door, going out the door? What are the development protocols for open source while it's in, while, while it's in development? Do we have to do similar things with hardware? Um, RTL, some of these open communities for RISC V. So we looked at that and uh, we felt after uh, going through a couple of use cases that we could actually map um, RISC V technology development into our currently defined process. So that was good. That didn't take too long. Uh, we we kind of checked that box. Again, these are formalities that exist within real you know, corporations that um, you get audited to. So we, we had to make sure we can at least map this into our process or, or make the appropriate changes to make it um, uh, fit. This this will, you know, it shows kind of the hardware and software in parallel. Really, it'll support both waterfall-ish as well as agile approaches, um, but so, never, it's, so it's flexible enough to accommodate both. Now, in the, you know, there's always been this historic kind of you know hardware software kind of thing going on here. I've been in the industry many years, and you know, uh, the 
our dream is always to have things, it's a very simple programming model. Um, uh, of course, not really achievable, but it's always our desire. Our hardware uh, brothers and sisters, um, a little bit more realistic and practical based on laws of physics. So uh, there's always this give and take between uh, how do you define the hardware you're going to implement. In microcontroller, again, we're trying to come up with a lot of very, well, some are very simple parts with a lot of derivatives, some are more complex SOCs, so it's kind of a wide range of mass market parts. But the discussion happens at one level every time anyway. What we're trying to do is get software to drive more of what the hardware, hardware definition is. Uh, that was one of the things we looked at. Now, software in the embedded space is growing uh, a lot. Uh, the amount of software that goes on an embedded device is, is, is really grown from just drivers and maybe uh, some simple operating system enablement like an RTOS into full applications. And these applications and use cases do require you to look more closely at those use cases and be able to uh, architect the system, both hardware and software, to map to, map to these use cases and applications. So it is a, uh, things are getting very, very complex, even in microcontroller space for embedded. And so it's, uh, software is becoming, I think, more prominent in the, in the forefront of designing a processor today than it was in the past. So really, it ends up looking a little bit more like this. Uh, software development starts a little bit later than hardware, uh, most cases, and it, it, and it usually goes much, much longer. The tail on software for embedded goes on for many, many months. And uh, what we're trying to ultimately do is get to, we are looking at a model of being able to shorten the software development time and drive more requirements into hardware at the same time. How can we change our, this model to make it, to accommodate that and use RISC-V as a, as a driver for that, okay? So that's kind of more the reality of it. Now what we've done also is, there's been a lot of throat over the wall, kind of the, uh, this, uh, things that happen, hardware, uh, teams, and this, you know, I've been doing this for many years. It's not that it's um, uh, malicious. It's just that many times, because of the the way these parallel development efforts go, a lot of hardware gets um, uh, decisions get made, and then software has to accommodate. And and that's just been the reality in my experience. And so we are trying to we want to try to invert that discussion a little bit and feed requirements into hardware as opposed to the other way around. So over the years, improvements have been made in the embedded space. We've um, uh, this whole approach of shift left software, being able to start software development much earlier, uh, using different types of models. We use fast emulation, fast FPGAs, to really accelerate software development. And that's, and that's helped. It, it's helped uh, as far as being able to start software development a little bit earlier shorten up the time, having more available with first silicon, and it's worked pretty well. But now we were looking for the next step. What else can we do to accelerate that and also, at the same time, drive innovation into the products we're building um, more, okay? So shorten the time and drive more innovation. So this, this worked well for a while. We still do this today, but we're looking for more, more innovation and even uh, faster um, development cycles. So what we did, the first step we took was we did an experiment using uh, software engineers in the microcontroller group, and what we did is ask them to go off, use some of the available tooling available and RISC-V implementations to uh, literally design or model and recommend specific core extensions based on RISC-V to feed into a design team to build a real product. So we found a software engineer um, that did, you know, typical embedded engineer, so, operates well at the hardware-software boundary. We asked him to do this experiment. He, he used um, uh, the uh, design construction language, Chisel, like Chris had talked about earlier. And uh, literally within weeks, he was able to take a, um, uh, a sample software application, simple IP checksum, but nevertheless it worked, um, convert that into uh, Chisel, generate some special instructions to accelerate that algorithm, and um, did it all with no hardware support at all. And uh, that, was a, that was actually pretty good for us because we wanted software to, again, take the lead in driving some of these hardware requirements. So he was able to do it. This is a, your typical senior embedded engineer. Uh, did a great job. As a matter of fact, he's in the audience today. You can go talk to him. Uh, Alex is up there. He did all this work by himself. Uh, and it, it really helped us. So we, we, we inserted that process into the beginning and we felt that if we can if we can pull this off, if we can get the 
get this kind of definition done um, without a lot of support, then we would, it would help us in driving the vision we wanted, uh, being able to uh, define the programming model the way we wanted it earlier. Programming model defined there is your basic control data synchronization. And um, we, we, so we checked that box. As a matter of fact, we, again, we used uh, Chisel. You can use any model, I think, would work just as well. We, we, we really like Chisel. Um, and we, um, we went through this process, and, and eventually out of the back end was a model that we can give to a design team, uh, programming details of the new instructions, and, and even intrinsics that support the, the extensions. And that, uh, we'll, we, we believe putting those into a standard format will allow us to do this often with different derivatives of cores innovating over and over again and have a standard intrinsic format that we can use for, with, for interaction with the design team. So we checked that box. That was, um, we felt that that was um, useful to drive further in-depth um, uh, design of devices with this approach. OK, now, so this is where we're going. Uh, I think, actually, even before 2020, I think we're at a, a point right now where in embedded in, in our industry, we, we, we think that we can get to the software drives hardware approach. So we're going to be doing more of this um, in our roadmap starting in the second half of this year. OK, so the other thing I want to mention, uh, and again, it's been talked about in several contexts. Let me just give you my perspective on this. Like I said, we do a lot of open source software development, and it does require a certain way of doing business. Um, uh, it's not free. It requires effort. It requires certain skill sets. It's just different. And but it, what we think by doing um, uh, open source, and it's become very big in the embedded space, as you can see there. Uh, uh, by leveraging open source, we, we believe it's a time to market thing for us. We think we can differentiate by um, uh, leveraging open source. And in the, in the embedded space, this is becoming more and more prominent as well. So we've been doing this already for quite some time, 15 years or so. And so we, we thought that, uh, well, can we apply the same principles to um, RISC V and some of the open RTL implementations? Can we just see what works and what doesn't? We didn't think it would be a direct kind of mapping, but we, we did think that it would be uh, somewhat useful to think about this. So you're probably familiar with this. Anyone that does open source, you know, the Free Software Foundation, free, you know, the Freedoms, this has been out there for quite a while. Um, you know, it's all about, it's, it's like, this, like it says up there, it's more free speech, not free beer. So in other words, it's all about collaboration. In a collaborative way, uh, more can get done uh, faster. Software generally could be better. Uh, more eyes are on it. Uh, you know the old, old expression, more, with more eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. We think that that really works. And uh, I, there's, uh, there's an existence proof of that I'll show you in just a second. And so we think that um, some of the similar concepts could apply to what we're trying to work on with uh, some of the open RISC V implementations. So we, we started thinking along those lines, at least mentally, how would that work? The, um, uh, you know, the, the whole contributor, mainline contributor model, uh, I, I think there is a, a rough analogy to that. I'll show you a little cartoon of that in just a second. Uh, but we think it works, and so we, um, we're actually managing some of our, both our hardware and our open, um, our community uh, RISC-V RTL uh, this way as well, uh, with commitments back to the, um, the community. And it seems to be working pretty well. Uh, we're using Polpino out of, um, University of Bologna in, in Zurich, um, but uh, um, we've looked at several of them. So you're, you're, again, you may be familiar with this, and I'm just showing you this because Linux over the years has, has morphed into many, many distributions, and they're all there um, for a reason. Some are community, some are commercial, some are for certain industries, et cetera. Uh, there's many of them. Um, which ones you support, again, is up to your business and your goals. Uh, but uh, it's managed pretty well in the community. And we think that, uh, we believe that there, there is an opportunity to have a similar model. Again, like I said earlier, the same, but a little bit different with um, managing RTL out of um, RISC-V. And again, this is a cartoon, so don't, it's not meant to be entirely accurate. The point I'm trying to make here is uh, with 
uh, different implementations, and I'll call them branches just to use an analogy to software off the main line. We believe there's different communities that can evolve that we can participate in, uh, and some we may participate, some we may lead. Uh, we'll contribute to some. We may uh, choose to hold some of these more proprietary for our, our own special sauce, but we, we believe that a, a community like this could evolve. Again, there is some definite dif differences in how this would work with um, RTL, um, but we, we, we still think a model like this could exist. We've actually implemented this uh, in a very rough way uh, inside of NXP, and we've um, been able to contribute back to the community, in this case, our Pulpino community, and it's actually worked roughly similar to the way we're managing our open source software. So we're, we, are, um, we are building product uh, with this model in place. Uh, right now we're using um, RISC-V mainly as minion cores, um, but uh, we believe this is going to accelerate, like I said, in the second half of the year. Um, we are, are the results of our experiments lead us to believe that we can do more with driving hardware, driving the requirements that go into these products. Um, but we are um, at a point where we think we can, we can now begin to leverage this and, and, and roadmap. So some of the work we've been doing over the last uh, 12 months is now, I think, starting to finally pay off. We're, we're actually building product. Again, right now, most of these are little controllers, little minion cores, but I believe that's the first step in an industrial setting, when you're doing new technology insertion, you know, this is the kind of thing you, you normally do, right? Take, kind of take a couple steps, a couple baby steps before you kind of jump all in. And that's what we're doing. So we've done our experiments, now we're trying to take it to the next step. Now what we, we have found, again, uh, this is data coming directly from the, the design team, and, and I think this also correlates roughly to open source software. When you're implementing anything based on open um, technology, uh, there is going to be effort. It's gonna, there's going to be work. It's not free. Uh, for example, uh, in, the, um, uh, in, the, in the community technology we are uh, you know, collaborating with, we found some bugs. Uh, we had to fix those bugs, contribute them back. We found about six issues. The good news is that the community accepted those, put them into the next release, worked really well. Um, the verification is always a challenge. Uh, so that took a little bit more time to re-verify re the entire uh, core once we once we contributed those bugs back. And I think that's kind of a standard problem uh, everywhere. But anyway, uh, architecture alignment. Uh, one of the things we, we wanted to do also with this these new cores was make sure that we can, if we had to put them into an SOC, do in such a way that uh, it, it can scale with uh, um, with different cores, different cores if we had to drop them in. So in other words, we had to develop a couple of um, gaskets for um, bus conversion. Um, we had to do a couple um, uh, interface changes to to allow um, a RISC-V core to operate um, in a similar environment, SOC environment, to other cores that we wanted to also use. So there was some architectural, I call it architectural alignment that had to be done. Some of that was pretty difficult. Uh, the, the, the reason the design effort is red is because there was some pretty significant effort to al um, al align it to the SOC flow and model, but once you do that, you can reuse all the, all the existing verification tests. That's why that's green. So the work put up front allows us to reuse all the tests in the back end. And then we added some new features as well. So again, not free, but, it, but, um, but definitely useful, and uh, we, we learned, learned a lot doing it, and uh, again, we're able to collaborate with the community to, to evolve this. So, um, so what do I think? Uh, I manage a, l a large software team. We work really closely with the hardware team and microcontroller. But we believe embedded software engineers are going to take a more prominent role at defining um, requirements for our processors going forward, uh, down to the specific instructions we want to use to accelerate certain functions. Um, it will be an iterative effort and a collaborative effort, but we believe now we have the tools and the technology with what we're working on with RISC-V to be able to do that at the next level. And so we're now going to be proceeding down that path. Uh, I do think as more of these implementations become available, uh, we, do, you know, we, we believe there's community opportunities for uh, additional collaboration. And so we, we're looking forward to, to participate more in the communities uh, with uh, RISC-V. And then I think also as we go forward, 
I think it would be a shame to not leverage some of the, the experiences from the other open communities in the last couple decades. Uh, they've gone through fits and starts too, but I do believe if we find the right um, um, ways to uh, share the experiences, I think it can be to, to our best interest. So I think we're gonna look very closely at that. And then all of this really rolls up into an ecosystem which ultimately is really vital to getting all this done. Uh, and that includes these open communities that I think will evolve over time. So uh, that's where we are, that's where we're going. And um, software drives hardware and we'll see where we, where we end up. So thank you very much. Did you find that it was easy to uh, integrate RISC-V with other uh, processor architectures? Yeah, um, it was a little bit difficult. You know, we, we were, we're an ARM-based com you know, company right now, and we, uh, some of the, the architectural alignment was initially, took a while to, to really understand some of the nuances of that. Um, but so yeah, I think it was moderately difficult at first, but uh, it's a cycles of learning thing. I think the next time we do this, we're gonna have a lot of that now already available. So I think it's gonna get a lot easier the next time through. The first time was a little bit more difficult. We did it with a design team of, um, a total design team of five guys to do, to do this chip, um, so.